Um, so I mentioned before, you know, my, uh, my somewhat unique training in non-operative peds ortho. Uh, I also mentioned that we are one of only two institutions that I am aware of that officially offer this annual, uh, fellowship annually. The other is in Madison, Wisconsin, and it is directed by our guest speaker today, Dr. Blaze Nemeth. Uh, when, as it pertains to non-operative pediatric orthopedics, Dr. Nemeth is the original. He is the originator. He is the godfather, if you will, uh, for non-operative physicians such as myself. Um, in peds orthopedics, a significant percentage of clinical visits can be managed conservatively without the need for, for surgical intervention. Approximately 12 years ago, Dr. Nemeth and Dr. Ken Noonan, a surgeon at uh, Madison, um, recognized the need for physicians who are specifically trained and considered experts in the pediatric musculoskeletal examination. And this fellowship was started, which Dr. Nemeth completed in 2004. This idea or concept of a non-operative pediatric orthopedic physician was not initially met with a great deal of enthusiasm, you know, but with effort, with fortitude of physicians like Dr. Nemeth, it is now widely accepted as an important role in the pediatric orthopedic community. Uh, Dr. Nemeth obtained a master's in science uh, at the University of Wisconsin prior to graduating from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis in 1997. He completed his pediatric residency at the University of Wisconsin in 2001, a fellowship in primary care clinical research in 2003 prior to the non-operative fellowship. He has co-authored, he has authored or co-authored multiple, multiple articles and book chapters, way too many to list at this time. He is a member of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, a committee member for the Council of Sports Medicine and Fitness of the American Academy of Pediatrics. He's been nominated multiple times for the University of Wisconsin Health Physician Excellence Award, and he's been recognized as a top doc in Madison Magazine for Pediatric Sports Medicine in 2014. Uh, he is currently an associate professor and clinical director of the pediatric orthopedics at the American Family Children's Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Dr. Blaze Nemeth. Well, thanks, Joe. That was way too kind of an introduction. So I appreciate you all inviting me down. It's my first time in Louisville. Uh, only time I've kind of been near here was when I was interviewing for residency programs over 20 years ago, and I just happened to stop at McDonald's on my way through. So uh, I apologize I didn't stay longer, and I'm disappointed I didn't stay longer after having a chance to see the city last night. So, um, so I'm going to get the day off talking about hip dysplasia, um, specifically developmental dysplasia of the hip, which I'll talk about the differentiation between those two things. Uh, I apologize if you haven't noticed the screen's a little fuzzy. They have somebody come in trying to work on that, but obviously for an orthopedic talk, that's going to be a little bit sketchy because I have x-rays and, and ultrasounds and things along those lines. Those of you in back are going to have a great view because the screen on the right is really nice and crisp and clear, so you're off to a great start. Everything that's on the talk is in my slides, so if you can't see it today, don't worry about it. You'll be able to pull it up later. Um, if you're like me when I was doing general pediatrics, I didn't look at a lot of these things anyways, and the ultrasounds kind of look like a weather map. Um, and so it may not make a lot of sense to begin with, but I'll try to point out the key points. I think we'll still be able to see it despite the haziness of the slides. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, today we're going to talk about difference between instability, radiographic dysplasia, and when you are going to use certain types of exam techniques and certain type of imaging techniques. We'll talk about the risk factors for screening for developmental dysplasia of the hip, which have changed a little bit. And then we'll talk about referral to pediatric orthopedics. So my first objective is to make sure you all are on my side. So um, this was in my mailbox this week, so I figured it was serendipitous and that I could use that in my talk to my advantage. <laughs> all right, so we'll start off with a case just to kind of put this in a frame of reference of why this is an important topic and why we all need to focus on this in our offices. So a four-year-old male comes into my clinic um, with his parents, concerned about his gait. He's been walking on his tiptoes of his left foot for the last three years since he started walking and really has no pain, no trouble keeping up with other kids, but parents are concerned because now he's going to start kindergarten and they're kind of thinking, you know, maybe this is something we should get taken care of before he's running around in school. So I'll show you a video here of his walking. So you can see how he's walking up on his toes on the left foot there. And when you take him back into the examination room, when you bend his hips and his knees, uh, which is called the Galeazzi maneuver, you can see that his right knee is higher than the left, so something's going on on that left side. And when you try to abduct his hips in the frog leg position, the left leg doesn't go out as far as the right. And when you get x-rays of his hips, these are a little bit difficult to see, but on the left side, 
right here. That left hip is dislocated. You can see the femoral head is smaller. He's developed a pseudoacetabulum, which is uh, actually an indentation in the pelvic bone as a result of the femoral head not being in the right place. Um, it doesn't have articular cartilage, so obviously not the kind of socket you want to have for the rest of your life. And the treatment for this is a fairly extensive procedure involving soft tissue, bony procedures, shortening the femur to be able to get the ball down to the level of the socket and get it back in, release the muscles and tendons around it to be able to take the pressure off of the femoral head, and then also doing surgery on the acetabular side to make sure the ball stays in the socket. So not quite your ideal outcome, and we'd like to be able to pick these up earlier and not have kids present to this point. So developmental dysplasia of the hip, if anybody in the room who trained my time prior to that, so 20 years ago, used to be called congenital dysplasia of the hip or congenital dislocation of the hip, and that was changed in the late 90s, uh, recognizing that this is a developmental process. It's not something necessarily that kids are always born with, but may occur after birth in the first few months of life. And dysplasia really meaning that it's just bad or atypical um, formation of the, the acetabulum and the femoral head. And again, this differentiates a little bit from the broader term that we use in orthopedics of hip dysplasia, which means that the hip didn't develop nor or is it doesn't have a normal configuration. But that could occur a lot later in life from somebody who has a slip capital femoral epiphysis, child with cerebral palsy, um, a child who has Perthes disease. So there's a number of things that can cause hip dysplasia. Developmental dysplasia of the hip is one of them. So the guidelines that we've relied on for the last 15 or 16 years came out of the American Ac Academy of Pediatrics. There's been a lot of effort to update and revise these because they're hazy at best. Um, there were some new guidelines that came out a couple of years ago which didn't get a lot of press, so that's one of the things I want to highlight a little bit today in the talk is kind of where things are going um, with this. But it was developed by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and it's been endorsed by the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and other musculoskeletal organizations. So the reason we worry about developmental dysplasia of the hip is that when a socket isn't normally developed, the ball can move around inside of it, so there can be abnormal motion. And then in a child who's developing where the socket is cartilaginous and the femoral head is cartilaginous, those things still have time to develop, and so they can develop abnormally. So if we can keep things where they need to be, there's a much higher likelihood that kids will develop a normal socket. And that whole process is really a spectrum. So it ranges from normal all the way down to a dislocated hip. And in between, you've got hips that are in the socket but can be dislocated, hips that are in the socket but move around more than normally, and then hips that are stable, you can't move them around, but the socket isn't normally developed, so radiographic dysplasia. You can only pick it up on an ultrasound or x-ray. And what we worry about is long-term having an, an abnormal shape to the socket, things moving around more, is that eventually it's gonna lead to early osteoarthritis. And we know that adults, who get hip replacements in their 20s and 30s, 25 or 30 percent of them end up having evidence of dysplasia from some time in childhood. We're not really sure why, but we think a lot of it goes back to infancy. So just keep in mind, again, that was kind of spreading it all out. What we're talking about is about 1 percent of the kids who are going to fall into this category. So it's not super common, but it makes it really easy to kind of get a little lackadaisical about our exams in our office and kind of not thinking about what we're doing when we're doing it and going through the motions, but the outcomes can be pretty severe if we miss it. So again, to kind of bring it around to context again, um, we'll go through a few cases. I have some questions in here. I like to use audience response a lot. We don't have that set up today, so this is really more just to get you to reflect for yourselves as we move on through the slides to think about how this applies to your practice. So a term newborn, uh, C-section for breech presentation, otherwise uncomplicated, did great after birth, exam was completely normal. So now you're gonna go examine the hips. What's kind of your first go-to thing? Um, for evaluation of the hips to see if there's any developmental dysplasia of the hips. Is it the Ortolani maneuver, the Barlow maneuver, getting an ultrasound, or getting an x-ray? So let's give you 15 sec 10 or 15 seconds just to kind of reflect on that first. And these questions don't really have a, necessarily a right or a wrong answer. There might be a more right or a more wrong answer. Um, but again, it's just to get you to reflect on things. So really the key exam maneuver is the Ortolani maneuver. Um, make sure the video works. So the Ortolani maneuver is this abduction of the hip and lifting the femoral head. So it's taking a hip, looking for a hip that's dislocated where the femoral head is sitting behind the acetabulum, and you're feeling that the sensation of what happens when it reduces. Um, the Barlow examination has always kind of been thrown into the same bucket as this. It's kind of part of the same process. We're actually starting to kind of try to work away from having people do the Barlow maneuver. If a hip is happy in the socket, we don't want people pushing it out. Let it tighten up. That's actually going to help the development over time. So you'll see in the literature, there's not a lot of mention of the Barlow maneuver 
more currently, um, and it's really kind of focusing on the Ortolani maneuver. We often do it in our offices in orthopedics because it's part of the process of evaluating subluxation, but um, studies have shown that most people apply way more pressure than they need to to evaluate the hip with the Barlow maneuver, and that that may have some role in inducing laxity of the capsule over time. So probably best left, left to leave that to the orthopedist. So if you haven't done a lot of these, if there's um, younger physicians or trainees in the room, a couple of key points that I think are important. I always start doing this on the parent's lap just in case the baby starts getting fussy and I get a little bit of something. But you really want to, then I move them over to the examination table. You want to do it on a firm surface because if they're rocking around, you're going to get a falsely positive or falsely negative examination. It could be hard to pick it up. You're really examining just one hip at a time. A lot of people will kind of do a frog leg or butterfly maneuver with the kids, and that's great to look at abduction, but it's really not the key, the key maneuver for looking at that dislocated hip and trying to pick it up. You want the baby to be relaxed, so either sucking on, a, um, sucking on something, have, them, have mom feed them before you do the examination. Babies are surprisingly strong, as you all know, and if they are fussy and fighting you, there's no way you're going to feel a dislocated hip. The muscles are going to contract and pull it and keep it in the socket, and you're going to have a negative exam. So you want to have them nicely relaxed. If they're really fussy, have them come back in a few, you know, you'll see them a few days later, you'll see them a couple weeks later, you'll see them a couple months later. So the serial examinations are really important. And really when you do this, it's a gentle maneuver. I tell people you really shouldn't have to force a hip out or back into the socket. It happens pretty easily. Um, if you find yourself when you're doing it, your knuckles are turning white, you're probably pushing too hard. So it should just be pronation and supination of your forearm and the weight of your arm on the baby's leg to kind of um, do the maneuvers. Just one important note, if you're doing this and the baby seems exceptionally fussy and you can't figure out why, especially in the newborn nursery, that's actually an indication that the, the hip may be infected. And the reason it's dislocated is because of the pus within the, the socket and it's pushing the hip out. And that's actually a surgical emergency. So they could have a group B strep septic arthritis in their hip. And really what we're trying to pick up is this. We're trying to pick up the clunk, the dislocated hip that's reducing. So this is a six-month-old baby, completely relaxed in the operating room, getting ready for some of the procedures that will happen, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So it's a pretty obvious exam most of the time. Every once in a while you get one that's a little bit subtle. Again, as we showed in that previous case, you may pick up a Galeazzi. Um, that's not always uh, easy to do in a little baby who has a diaper on and who has tiny little legs. So you examine the baby, you do feel a clunk. What's your next step? Do you get orthopedics to consult in the hospital while the baby's still there? Do you send them to outpatient orthopedics and have them follow up in clinic? Do you get an ultrasound or do you get an x-ray? So again, take a few seconds to think about what you would do. So and I think most places will lead towards one of the first two approaches. Um, Typically at our group, our babies are born at one hospital, we're at a different hospital. There's lots of studies to show that you don't necessarily need to get treatment started immediately before the baby goes home, but every practice has their preference. So talk to your providers, talk to the group here, what they prefer to do with things. Um, we're very comfortable seeing these kids a week or two later. For a hip that's uh, unstable, a lot of times they'll tighten up over those first couple of weeks and you may not necessarily have to start treatment. Um, so I th I'm happy to, to give kids a week or two to see what they'll do on their own. We typically don't get imaging at the very beginning of all of this because it doesn't change what we're gonna do. If the hip is unstable on our examination, we know it's not normal and we're gonna treat it. If it's stable, then we're gonna uh, go into our imaging processes down the road, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Just one thing to note that as you go through some of the, if you're looking at the current guidelines and uh, some ones that were published by the American College of Radiology, that they do talk about getting an ultrasound before you start treatment just to make sure there really is something going on and we're not over-treating these hips. So again, for the ones that feel stable, we're not, those are the ones that we will image, but if it's unstable and popping in and out, it's pretty clear that that hip's not, gonna, not normal and that we need to do something. And this is what it would look like on pathologic section. Of course, there has to be some sort of, you know, kind of something gross in an orthopedic talk. I'm not a surgeon, so I get these from my partners. Um, but I think this is a really nice, um, evident uh, picture of what things look like when you have a normal hip versus not. So, oops, did my attention button there, I apologize. So the left hip here is the normal one. You can see a nice deep socket. Femoral head is big. The rim is very nice and sharp and discreet. Here on the right side, this is what a dysplastic dislocated hip looks like. Femoral head's really small, acetabulum small, really ill-defined rim. There's a bunch of schmutz right in the middle of the socket. So this is not a normal hip, but over time, getting those two things in contact with one another will usually induce normal development. 
And what we're really trying to do with our treatment is keep kids from the positions that the hip will not stay in the socket and that that development won't occur. So when the thigh gets adducted across the body, that tends to force the femoral head away from the acetabulum. So the treatment that we use with the Pavlik harness is really to limit that motion. So even though it looks like the kids have their hips pulled out, to the, their legs pulled out to the side um, to reduce the hip, which is part of the treatment, it's really more to limit the motion where the ball wants to pop back out of the socket and to keep it in place. Pavlik harness, we all feel like is a very successful treatment. Most of the studies that have looked at it have shown 80 to 95% success, depending on who you're using it in and a bunch of other parameters. So that's usually our go-to here in the States. Really, if you start within the first couple of months, the results are very good with that. So that's another reason why our group is not so concerned about getting it started immediately and having um, things get a little bit of a chance to see what they do on their own. If it does stabilize, in my practice, we'll usually end up holding off on starting the treatment and then get some imaging down the road, make sure that it's really dysplastic now that it's stable and see if we need to treat at that point. Interestingly, the new AAOS guidelines talk about the fact that there's very limited evidence as far as good outcome studies looking at the Pavlik harness. The only thing that has really good outcome studies is the von Rosen splint, which isn't used real widely in the United States, uh, but that's the one that tends to be, uh, have the, really have the only data that they were able to find in the AAOS review. But I think, again, we still go with the Pavlik. It's a relatively safe treatment. There are a few things that we keep in mind as we're going through with this. One of the things is, and we think these are all related to the harness being too small, so we see the babies very regularly during the first couple months while we're going through the treatment. And if the harness is too small, there are straps, which are a little difficult to see here, that go over the shoulders, and then straps that come down to the front of the legs and the back of the legs. So if the straps up on the shoulders, um, if the harness gets too small and the baby's fighting, those straps on the shoulders can pull down on the shoulders and cause a brachial plexopathy where the baby won't move their arm, they might get like an herbs palsy. Um, so if we see that, typically if you stop the brace, it recovers within a day or two and then we can reinitiate treatment. But if we are adjusting the brace rapid, regularly, that usually keeps us out of any issues. Again, if the brace is too small and the hips are too flexed as they are getting pretty close in this baby, that can actually impinge on the femoral nerve and cause a femoral neuropathy. And again, they may not move their legs very well. So we always tell the parents to take it off once a day and just make sure that they move. A lot of places will keep kids in at 24 seven and not take it off at all. So there's a, a variation in practice. The one that we all really worry about is avascular necrosis. So if the baby's brace is too small and the hips are overly abducted, it can actually put so much pressure on the femoral head that it may overcome the perfusion pressure of the capillaries to the femoral head and then cause avascular necrosis. It's a not very well understood entity. There's a lot of controversy about how it occurs, but it's the one thing we worry about because you can't identify it until the femoral head starts to ossify, which is gonna be a year or so down the road. And by then the cow's out of the barn and you really can't do a whole lot about it besides just kind of try to salvage it. So in our practice, what we typically do is about six weeks of full time in the harness to be able to get that hip to stabilize, get things to start to shape to one another. We'll adjust it every week or two, depending on how quickly they're growing and how rapidly we're needing to make changes. Get an ultrasound at three or four weeks and make sure that when the hip is stable that it's actually in the socket and not still dislocated because we don't want to try to keep forcing that ball back in and cause avascular necrosis. And then we'll switch them over to nighttime wear um, and then follow up with x-rays as they're continuing to grow to make sure as the acetabulum ossifies that we're seeing the bony development of the acetabulum and the femoral head look normal. These protocols are all really variable. Um, our APPs in our practice joke that if you put 100 orthopedists in a room, you'll get 100 different feelings on how to do all of this. So it's one of the reasons why the guidelines are a little bit sketchy on things at times. So for a baby who doesn't, dis uh, doesn't reduce with treatment, uh, they'll usually go to the operating room. They'll do an arthrogram. You can see that the femoral head hasn't ossified in the six-month-old. If you put dye around the hip, you can, or into the hip, you can identify the ball, which is here. When the hip is abducted, it reduces, so then that's when they go to hip spica casting. Usually there'll be some soft tissue surgeries um, along with that to make sure that, again, that there's not too much pressure on the femoral head after it's reduced, usually just a tenotomy of the adductors. So we'll switch to a different case and a little bit of a different scenario. So a five-day-old comes in after discharge from the hospital for the normal newborn follow-up. Feeding's going great, weight's down just a little bit, really not much for jaundice. You go to examine the hips and you feel some clicks on, on your examination on both sides. So what's your next step? Do you refer this baby to orthopedics? Do you do an ultrasound? Do you do an x-ray? Or do you have them come back and see them at that two to three week well child check and see how things are at that point? So 
So clicks are a big reason for referral in my practice, just because people aren't really sure what to do with them. And a lot of the confusion, I think, goes back to terminology. So the original papers on this were written by Ortolani, who was Italian, and Damine, who was French. And so like most Romance languages, there's a lot more description in the terms that they used than just the simple literal translation that occurs. So this verb, segno or signe, um, is literally translated as a click. I came across one translation at a time that described it as the click of like when you're rolling a wheeled cart down the hallway and you hit a bump in the tile and you feel that bump and kind of hear the click of the wheel go over that bump. And that's really, I think, a really good kind of demonstration of what this is like. It's more than just the sound of the click. It's you're really kind of feeling that bump as it occurs. And part of the problem has been that the Europeans have kind of stuck to this terminology over the course of the last hundred years almost now. Um, it's kind of switched over the course of the last 10, or year, 10 years or so, so I think it's becoming more consistent on what we're really looking for and, and kind of getting away from using the term click. We do know that hip clicks in what we feel, which are kind of soft adventitial findings, tendons or ligaments popping over bony bumps, they tend to be a little higher pitched. They usually go away by six months and they're not associated with any underlying dysplasia of the hip and that's been demonstrated uh, in this study by Henricus, which is in your, your handout if you can't read it on the slides here. If you're not sure, we'll talk about it. Refer them in. We're happy to see them and just double check and make sure. Sometimes the exams can be very subtle. We'd be happy to, to take care of that from that standpoint in our practice. And, and I see Jed nodding over here, so I think he feels the same way. So, All right. Um, and then another case, five-day-old male presents for evaluation after going home from the hospital. Uncomplicated pregnancy. Um, was in a breech position, but then verted prior to a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. Hip exam in the hospital was normal, and now in your office, the exam's normal as well, including the hips. So what's your plan for this baby? Are you gonna reassure the family that the hips are doing great, nothing to worry about? Do you reevaluate them again in one to two weeks at that well child check? Do an ultrasound, do an x-ray, or send them off to orthopedics at this point? All right, so based on the old guidelines, that were out of pediatrics, which I think still apply to some degree. Um, screening was recommended for breech females, and everybody else kind of left it to, uh, everything else was left to the discretion of the evaluator, which really didn't help all of us in practice, because it's kind of like, well, what do you do? So serial examinations are important. Imaging was offered up as an optional uh, evaluation, and we'll talk about that. So the indications for ultrasound, based on those recommendations and their literature review, was that if they were female in a breech position, those were really the important things. And that breech position is really the last trimester. So just because a baby's born head first, if they were crunched in the wrong position for three months, that's probably going to affect their hips. So it doesn't matter how they come out, it's how they were before they ended up coming out. Um, and then family history was another risk factor. And then the, every time you go to a talk, you'll hear an orthopedist talk about their other favorite um, kind of risk factor, whether it's being a firstborn, any other kind of packaging uh, deformities like torticollis or foot deformities. The old guidelines had a lot of controversy around them about 10 years ago or so. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force did a review um, and said, really, screening is not recommended because there's a high rate of false positives. There's no good outcome studies, just like every evidence-based review that happens. And as many of you are aware, the USPSTF does great research and great publications, but many of their recommendations have not been without controversy for a lot of these reasons, whether you're talking about prostate screening or, or uh, breast cancer screening. Um, part of it is, is that they do their reviews not thinking about the economics. They're specifically set aside to not include cost effectiveness analysis, which I think is a big part of this. So um, the POSNA response, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, said that you really can't do a data-driven analysis of this because we don't have good data. So we really need to go with more of a model-driven approach and put it into practice and make it uh, a contextual for people. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon guidelines really aren't too far off. Um, they found that there's not a lot of data out there. There's pretty limited evidence for a lot of the things that we do, which doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that there's not things to support a lot of it, and we're going off of our experience as a result. The things that did have moderate evidence was that definitely not to do universal screening because of the high false positive rates, and then do an ultrasound somewhere between two to six weeks of age, or an x-ray at four months. And the risk factors they identified as being important were being breach and having a family history, and then if there was an examination that showed clinical instability. So females did not really kind of have an increased risk based on their analysis of the literature. So as far as imaging goes, I know I'm gonna run over by just a few minutes here, but I figured I'd help Phil because of some of the surgeon time in here that we're missing today, so. Um, you can see if you get x-rays on a two-month-old hip, 
the femoral heads are not ossified, so you're, it's really hard to kind of know what anatomy you're dealing with, which is why we prefer ultrasound. Ultrasounds, I think, are a little difficult to look at because they're always done kind of from a sideline position. Um, if you flip it 90 degrees, I think that always makes it a little bit more contextual for people to kind of look like the acetabulum that you see when you look at an x-ray. And you can see the, I'll do it on the here so the group in back can see. So here's the acetabulum over the top. This is the femoral head. Little white spot is actually some ossification occurring within the center. What we're really looking for is one of the measurements on there is the alpha angle, which basically measures kind of the steepness of the roof of the acetabulum. We want that to be over 60 degrees, which is more horizontal and flat. Recommendations are to perform it at three to four weeks of life or even maybe a little bit older just to reduce that risk of false positives. And every group has a little bit of a different preference on that. X-rays are great when kids are four to six months old because now they're starting to ossify their femoral heads and things show up on the x-rays and you can actually measure what you want to do. Um, Emory and the group out of San Diego showed that for babies who are breached, there's a higher risk of false negative ultrasounds. So they recommended getting x-rays on kids who were breached, which I think falls in line with the, the current guidelines. When you have a dislocated hip, you can see that the femoral head is much smaller, as you can see in the circle here. Um, it's a little hard to see on the screen up front, I apologize. And it's obviously not in the acetabulum, which is marked by the white line that's on there. All right, so this is our last case. It'll be done in about a minute. Um, Four-week-old female, born breech, normal hip examination, ultrasound screening, um, which you did because of that breech uh, presentation. Left hip had an alpha angle of 50 degrees, was about 40% covered. The right was 60 degrees and 60% covered. There was no instability on examination, and so the radiologist's interpretation is that this is consistent with developmental dysplasia of the hip. So at this point, do you refer to orthopedics? Repeat the ultrasound in a week, repeat the ultrasound in a month, reevaluate the hips at the next examination, or wait and do an x-ray when they're four months old. See a lot of perplexed faces, that's fine. That's part of the, that's part of the confusion around hip display, about, around developmental displays of the hip. And this is probably the area that's most controversial of exactly what do you do. So if a hip is stable but radiographically dysplastic, most of the literature seems to support that if it's between 50 and 60 degrees, that's probably going to improve on its own. May not be a bad idea to have them see orthopedics just to continue to follow up with that, depending on how far they have to travel, how much you trust your local, local ultrasonographers and radiographers. You can do the ultrasound there before you send them in. Um, I usually just repeat it after three or four weeks if they're stable, but for me it's a shared decision-making process with the family and what's their preference and how do they weigh the risks and benefits of what we're going to do. Dynamic ultrasounds are even more problematic because if they're seeing a little bit of movement on the ultrasound, but you can't feel it, is that clinically significant or not? And we don't have the studies to really support it. So um, we'll hedge a little bit on a lot of those. So with referral based on ultrasound, for sure if it's 50 degrees, I think it's appropriate to refer those in. Um, we may watch them, we may start treating them. In my practice, I typically will treat kids who have alpha angles under 50 degrees. If they're unstable on the dynamic maneuvers, depends on how my examination is. If I can't feel it, I don't worry about it too much, but we may follow it with serial ultrasounds. If the alpha angle is between 50 and 60 degrees, I'll usually, uh, on the repeat ultrasound, again, kind of make that shared decision making with the family. I may repeat another ultrasound, or we may just wait and do an x-ray down the road or start treatment. It really kind of goes all different ways. So this is my second to last slide. Um, so our goal with this is really that we want kids to grow up and become adults who have a lifelong hip that's going to last, um, because that's really what's going to work best. This is an x-ray of a 20-year-old who has already had uh, so much, dis who had dysplasia and had so much arthritis and problems on the right hip has already gone on to a total hip on that side. And then on the left is dysplastic. It's really hard to see on this uh, x-ray, but I think you can probably get the gist by looking at the x-ray on the left that they ended up having a pretty big surgery to try to improve the relationship between the femoral head and the acetabulum to try to buy some more time out of this hip. So just to conclude, unstable hips, probably more urgent rather than emergent, which we have kind of been taught over the years. We usually like to see them within a couple of weeks in our office. Referrals from the outside, we, don't, we ask that they don't get the imaging and let them see us first so that we can do the imaging and take the management from there just to try to limit uh, cost and inconvenience to the family. If hips are stable, get an ultrasound sometime around four weeks of age. Uh, refer if they're abnormal or if you have clinical concerns, don't have a hesitancy to send those babies in. And then continue to examine them at every well child check. 
um, because those serial examinations are really our most important screening tool. If there's clicks, those usually are not associated with DDH, but if something still just doesn't feel right, send them in, we'll take a look at them. Uh, if there's any concerns, don't have any hesitancy to send, refer them or to even get imaging. Um, X-rays are really low radiation. I think we all worry about it, but it's a very small dose to pick up a very serious issue and it's well worth the risk. Uh, resources are all in your handouts. Um, there's a nice video uh, that Brian Shaw, who's one of the authors of the second paper on here, on the uh, section on orthopedics site on the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is linked in your, uh, is in the handout and the link is there. Um, the second article down, written by Rick Schwen, Brian Shaw, and Lee Siegel, was actually, I think, kind of a basis. We were working on developing new guidelines within AAP, but it takes a long time to go through that process. And while it was stuck in committee, the AAOS published their guidelines and kind of beat them to the punch. So I think they kind of revised it and made it more of a clinical paper. And I think it's, a real, it's kind of the latest and a really good clinical paper on practical things to be thinking about in your office. And the bottom group, the International Hip Dysplasia Group, is out of Orlando. They have a lot of great resources on their website. Um, they have a lot of money to work with in studying this issue. So their sponsor, kind of their main sponsor is Larry the Cable Guy. His baby had developmental dysplasia of the hip. And um, when he was talking with Chad Price, who is down there, realized that he heard that there was really not a lot of research and that we need more money to do that research. So he has stood up and really kind of been a, a huge proponent for looking into this more. So hopefully we'll have more information over time. So thank you very much. And I know I've gone over, so I apologize. But. <laughs>